Well, welcome, everybody. Please take your seats. We're going to start this uh, colloquium, which is uh, dedicated to space, time, number, and their interactions in the brain. Um, I am extremely happy uh, that this, collo can take this colloquium can take place here at the Collège de France. And first, I would like to thank our sponsors who helped make this colloquium possible, the École des Neurosciences de Paris, ENP, uh, which uh, hosts actually a large number of uh, students and postdocs in Paris, if you're interested in neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience at large. Collège de France, of course, uh, this institution, uh, which provides open courses for everybody on all topics of science and uh, humanities. And Fondation Hugo, du Collège de France, which uh, sponsors us. And ESCOP, European Society for Cognitive Psychology, this is a European colloquium. Uh, this uh, colloquium is uh, organized with several colleagues. We'll also speak during the day, uh, Martin Fisher, Samuel Shaki, and uh, Marco Zorzi. And it is a celebration of 20 years of research, uh, 20 years of uh, the SNARK effect, the publication of the SNARK effect. So I would like to tell you in my introductory talk, I will try to uh, give you a little bit of the landscape of uh, research on uh, space and number in particular through a historical review of uh, what happened in this field. Um, and in particular, celebrating the SNARK effect and explaining you why it's called the SNARK effect. Um, so I project myself back 20 years ago or 22 years ago when we started to do these experiments with uh, two students, my first two students actually, Serge Bossini and Pascal Giraud. I think Pascal Giraud should be here in this room somewhere. I haven't seen him yet. Um, and um, basically, um, we were doing experiments on numbers to try to understand how numbers were represented at the level of the meaning, uh, the semantics of number. And this experiment was essentially to try to see what sort of lexicon people had about uh, numbers. How did they knew specific properties of numbers, such as the fact that four is even, and five is odd, and five is a prime, and so on and so forth. And in order to investigate this, we decided to use a very simple task, which was to show digits on the screen, and subjects would click to tell us what, whether it was odd or even, left or right. But because we were uh, you know, psychologists, we knew we had to balance everything, and so we balanced the assignment of the odd response to to the right hand or to the left hand. And so in different blocks, you had to say odd with the right and even with the left or the converse. And um, the first trace of the snark was a funny triple interaction. I still remember vividly, it was very significant, but it looked like a triple interaction of block parity and magnitude, it's very obscure. And um, it took uh, an afternoon to dig through it and finally find the right way to plot it. And I think this is the right way to plot it. Here what you can see is the different numbers. And we plotted the difference in reaction time between pressing to the right key and pressing to the left key. And because of this random assignment, we get presses on both sides. And you can see that there is an extremely regular effect that the larger the number, the faster you are to press with the right hand. And the smaller the number, the faster you are to press with the left hand. And this is a monotonic effect. And um, okay, uh, you will see that there are many experiments on this topic. We did nine experiments on this topic in the paper, and we found this very solid effect. We needed a name for it. And of course, it looked a little bit like a Stroop effect. It looked like the magnitude of the number interacted with uh, space somewhat irrepressibly. Also, it was not needed for the task. And uh, so Stroop was a nice name. It turned out it's the name of the person, actually, and my name is not nearly as exciting as Stroop. So we thought of a name, and uh, we said, well, maybe SNARK. SNARK is for Spatial Numerical Association of Response Codes. Well, you know, you have to finish the word. Um, but SNARK is, of course, the very famous name that uh, Lewis Carroll gave to his uh, fantastic creature in uh, this uh, wonderful poem, The Hunting of the SNARK. And because we did these nine experiments chasing this effect, trying to understand it, we thought this was a nice metaphor for scientific inquiry, actually. So I'm going to use the SNARK metaphor for this research. But you do have to know that we made a spelling error. It's not really an error. But we couldn't find the acronym for the case in SNARK. Um, now, in the SNARK, there is a character called the Bellman, and he makes this very important scientific statement, which I think politicians also know very well. What I tell you three times is true. And uh, I, I think it's an incitation to, re to replicate for scientists. So we did replicate. 
And uh, in the paper, there are several experiments. Uh, I will just show a few of them. Uh, one of them shows that there is no effect of handedness. So we uh, went after subjects that were left-handed. We found about 10 of them. And you can see that the snark effect is still present in people who are lefties. Uh, so it's not, it has nothing to do with being right-handed or left-handed. Um, we ask whether it depends on space or whether it depends on the hand. After all, when you're pressing on the right hand, you are pressing on the right hand side of space, but you're pressing with the right hand. So what matters? So we did this very funny experiment where people did this odd even classification, but they crossed their hands and they had to press right with the left hand and left with the right hand, which takes a little while to learn, but after a few minutes, people can do that. And what we found was that when you cross the hands, the effect still depends on the side of space, not the side of the hand. So it has nothing to do with the specific hand or the hemisphere. In fact, matters are a bit complicated now, but uh, the dominant effect is one of the side of space, abstract space, outside space. And finally, we did this other experiment that showed that it's not really specific numbers that are associated with specific spatial locations, but it is an effect of the relative size of numbers. And so we did this by having one block where subjects uh, rated numbers or classified numbers between 0 and 5, and another block where they uh, classify numbers between 4 and 9. In both cases, they did the same task of odd even judgment. And as you can see, the middle numbers, 4 and 5, change sides as a function of the block in which they are in. So that suggests that it really is the relative size of the numbers that determines uh, the side of space that you are going to prefer to click with. So there is a sort of computation in the brain that, that relates the size of the number in the context of the experiment with the size of space. And what I tell you three times is true. It's the real snark effect. Um, we looked after the direction of this effect. It's a funny thing, you know, large numbers with the right side of space. Why is that? And uh, Pascal Giraud went after subjects that wrote from right to left in an attempt to see whether this was the origin of the effect. It was hard to find people who only wrote right to left. And what we could find was subjects that came from Iran. We used uh, their own notations for digits. But these subjects uh, had been in France for uh, variable amounts of time. And what we found here is that there was a normal snack effect from left to right for subjects that had been in France for a long time, 8 to 12 years. But for those who just arrived in France, the effect tended to cancel or even reverse. Okay. This was the first trace that indeed there was an effect of reading direction. And now there are many experiments uh, by Zebian, by Hung et al., by Shaki, who is here. Uh, and he's going to talk more about this issue of the cultural origins of the snark effect. Um, I just want to say that now we know that the effect is more flexible than that. It's not strictly determined by the direction of reading, but the direction of reading is also one of the main biases that determines it. It determines the direction of the effect, but the existence of the effect is much earlier. So in children, if you look for the strict snark effect in an odd even judgment task, you find that it appears relatively late, around the third grade, at a time where there is a sort of automatic interpretation of these symbols as quantities. But in fact, we will hear later today from Lola de Hevia um, that there are much earlier linkages between number and space and time, uh, these dimensions seem to be tightly intertwined from the beginning, really from infancy. And the direction of that effect may change from culture to culture, but the existence of a link uh, is very early on. Now, this is the fate of the snark. Uh, I made this graph a few days ago, uh, and uh, this is uh, our paper. It was cited 967 times, which uh, really is stupefying in, in 20 years. I'm not sure exactly what caused the kink, but starting at 2000, it started to rise and rise, and it still hasn't stopped. Um, maybe somebody should do experiments on another topic at some point. Um, so we'll, we'll hear a lot about different versions of the snark effect today. I just wanted to show you a few of my favorites. Um, there were some remarkable extensions, uh, mostly by people at this colloquium. Uh, one of my favorite is Marco Zorzi's demonstration that neglect patients um, neglect the number line. So um, he will speak more about this later, but the, the main finding is that patients who have spatial hemi neglect, and you know that most of them with a the right hemispheric lesion, they will neglect the left side of space, they seem to also neglect numbers. And if asked to bisect numbers, and you tell them, you know, tell me which number is between 11 and 19, they might say something like 17. 
or 18, which is completely off, or they might even say 21, which is off the original interval, as if they neglected the left side of numbers. And because it's a verbal input, it's a verbal output, I love this bisection task, it means that internally there has been some spatial representation of the numbers. Um, now, uh, Martin Fisher also did a wonderful experiment in 2003 um, showing that the Posner task, another very important pillar of cognitive psychology, could be affected uh, by uh, numbers so, such that if you flash a number in the middle of the screen here, the attention of the subject seems to be attracted to the right side when it's a large number and to the left side when it's a small number such that their detection time, this is the time to detect a little blackening of one of these squares here, the time to detect these targets will depend on the size of the number which is in the middle, although it's irrelevant to this attentional task. So um, again, there is debate as to how strong this effect is, but uh, it might depend on what kind of task you have to do with digi this digit. But there is a suggestion that there is very strong at attraction of attention to one side or the other, just based on the size of the numbers. And finally, a third favorite here, is this Lurcher et al. paper where they show that um, if you take a subject, you put it in darkness, and you ask him to generate random numbers. So it looks like a crazy task of just generating random numbers. But surreptitiously, you measure the movements of the eyes of the subject. What you find is that you can predict the size of the numbers that they are going to generate relative to the previous number. So whether it's going to be larger or smaller than the previous number, you can predict based on where the eyes deviate. You can see here the change in eye position, leftward, rightward, as well as downwards, upwards. And it is the case that you can predict to some extent the random numbers based on measuring the eye movements of the subjects, which is extraordinary. So again, a suggestion that there are very, very automatic links between exploring space with your eyes and exploring number space to generate random numbers. So all of this data, year after year, was coming to suggest that there were extremely intimate links between space, time, and number, and that these were fundamentally intertwined uh, representations in the minds, uh, including the minds of very young children. And uh, my claim has been throughout the years that this effect is important, not just because it is strong and replicable in psychology, but also because it points to the history of mathematics. At least it shows us that it is a very strong intuition in mathematics, in all of us, that uh, sort of proto-mathematical intuition that when we have a number, it can be mapped onto space. And likewise, that there are mappings between space and time and between time and number, that all of these dimensions are related. Now, if you think of the constructions of mathematics, they all involve, to some extent, mappings between these domains. Uh, geometry is founded upon the notion that number applies to space. Uh, the notion that uh, complex numbers form a plane, for instance. These are all metaphors that could not exist if we didn't have this ability to very quickly apply this metaphorical mapping between number and space. Now, there were many questions to ask with this effect, and one of them is the place for the snark. Where is it occurring in the brain? The place of, for the snark is the beginning of the poem of Lewis Carroll. It's, uh, the bellman says, just a place for a snark, the bellman cried, as he landed his crew with care, supporting each man on the top of the tie by a finger entwined in his hair. And this is a pretty nonsensical poem at times. Just a place for a snark, I've said it twice, that alone should encourage the crew. Just a place for a snark, I have said it thrice. What I tell you three times is true. So where, where is the place for the snark in the brain? Uh, well, we had an idea. Uh, and of course, we knew that uh, the horizontal segment of the intraparietal sulcus, the hips, by the way, this is also a funny acronym, but few people noticed it was a bit funny. Um, the hips um, was a site for uh, number processing. Um, so many experiments year after year, uh, many led with Manuela Piazza in the lab, and she will also speak later today, uh, demonstrated that there was a tight association between number processing and this bilateral site deep into the intraparietal sulcus in the parietal lobe, which would systematically activate whenever subjects calculated or indeed thought about numbers, regardless of the particular format in which the numbers were presented. And um, further explorations of this region suggested that indeed it could be a place for the snark in the sense that this region in the parietal lobe was surrounded by many other regions that had to do with spatial representations or visual spatial transformations. 
So in this experiment here, uh, we looked at subjects doing calculation, but also many other tasks, such as grasping objects, moving your hands in space, um, moving your eyes or just your attention, saccades versus attention, and by making intersections of these different tasks, we could see in human subjects, um, with Olivier Simon, the organization of the parietal lobe for these different functions, and we noticed there was a highly regular map. You can see it in these different slices. We, we have these activations to saccades in the back and to grasping in the front, and as we go up, we begin to see this activation to number. There's one on the right side, which we can't see very well on these old slices, uh, but uh, you see this strong number of activation surrounded now by also by activation related to moving the hands in space, in particular pointing the finger, as well as movements of attention in this more dorsal, perhaps uh, homologue of area LIP. This was already more than 10 years ago, and it, it pointed to this highly systematic organization that is summarized here, where number would be surrounded by all sorts of other uh, parameters in the brain that have a sp certain visual spatial um, transformation nature. So we wondered whether this was a possible site for number space interactions, but also uh, there was this fantastic homology which seemed to be popping out with the macaque monkey brain where a similar sort of map is uh, present, maybe not exactly homologue, but similar. And of course, later today, Andreas Nieder will tell us about his amazing discovery that deep inside the intraparietal sulcus, there are neurons that care about number, uh, fulfilling completely this sense of homology. And these neurons are indeed completely intertwined with other neurons that care about the sense of size and the sense of movement in space. Um, so we decided to hunt the snark with fMRI and to heed the advice of Lewis Carroll. They sought it with symbols, they sought it with care, they pursued it with forks and hope. Well, we had hope, we didn't have forks, but we had fMRI and we had a beaver uh, who liked to dig into these issues, uh, Ed Hubbard, who unfortunately could not be here today, but did this very nice experiment, which is not yet published, I hope it will be published uh, today, uh, one day, um, where um, essentially we did the SNARK task, the original SNARK task inside the fMRI. So subjects would see digits, and they would have to click right or left as a function of whether it was odd or even, but to decorrelate the hand and the side of space, we had subjects cross their hands on two blocks inside the fMRI. And they were reminded on every block of the instruction. So we had, in the end, three completely orthogonal factors, the hand that was used for clicking, left or right, the side of space, left or right, and the size of the number, large or small. We also had a saccade paradigm of the different blocks, so we had saccade direction as another factor, left or right. And we had an arithmetic localizer which allowed us to localize this HIPS activation to subtraction problems relative to match non-numerical sentences. So with all of that, what could we do? Well, we could localize, first of all, we could replicate the snark effect. This is easy. Uh, I have to say it's not a very strong snark effect in the fMRI. I don't know if some of you have replicated the snark effect in fMRI. I suspect that the fact that the subject is lying down on his back and seeing the world with a mirror is causing a sort of spatial disorientation. And we find the effect was much weaker. But we did find that we could replicate it and that it was associated with the side of space and not with the hand with which the subject was clicking. And then we isolated different regions of interest. Um, so you can see them here. If we looked for response hand, right versus left hand, I, I'm only showing you the left hemisphere here, we easily find these anterior regions that care about the side of the hand. If we go a little bit back, we find this smaller region that cares about the side of space. So it cares about whether the response was made on the right or on the left side of space. If we go very much to the back, there are of course occipital activations, but in the parietal cortex there are these LIP-like areas uh, coding for the side of the saccade that the subject is making. And this is our localizer for the HIPS region, caring about quantities. And now we could see each of these regions. Now there are three different slices. You can see that in the front we find this hand-related activation, so the color is by the uh, side of the hand that's responding, left or right. Um, if we go slightly backward to a more posterior slide, we see this effect of space and still some effect of hands. And if we go very much back in the brain, this is the back of the brain, you can see this effect of the side of saccade. So clearly differentiated spatial responses. So now that we had this effect, we could ask which one is responsible for the snark effect. For that, we would take these regions of interest and ask, do they have an effect of the magnitudes of numbers? And this is 
this complicated but easy to understand slide actually. So you have these four regions of interest for the hands, for space, for saccades, and for calculation. And for each of them we can ask, is there a main effect of the side of the hand, side of space, side of saccade, and the magnitudes of the numbers? The diagonal is trivial because that's how we selected the regions. But the non-diagonal terms are non-trivial. And they show you, for instance, that there's a little bit of crosstalk, that the space region likes to care also about the hand. It's not purely about space. It's a little bit about both. But very importantly, you have this cell here. This is the only cell where we find that there is a significant effect of the magnitude of the numbers. If the numbers are large, you tend to activate a little bit more of the region of a space uh, that cares about the saccades side, okay, in this LIP-like, very posterior region, with the appropriate direction, such that large numbers evoke the right side of space and therefore left-sided activation in the brain. So we believe that this is evidence, although it's a small effect, you know, but uh, it's a significant effect suggesting that it could be at this level of these hips to LIP interactions that this effect could be occurring. And of course, we know from the uh, macaque monkey that if these areas are homologue of LIP and VIP, these areas are interconnected by monosynaptic connections. So it's a likely source of interaction. It would mean that numbers interact very strongly with the sense of space which is behind your exploratory saccades and movements of attention. Now, we also wondered whether we could get larger effects in calculation. Calculation is a situation where you have many numbers and the numbers move as a function of whether you calculate. So we wondered whether arithmetic operations were comparable to a movement on the number line. And uh, um, at that time, there was the coming work of uh, Colleen McCrink and Karen Nguyen showing us that we could test approximate calculation. We believe these regions have to do also with approximation with very simple movies. I want to show you this old movie uh, by Colleen McCrink, which uh, was used actually to test whether infants have a sense of number. So completely non-verbal, non-symbolic presentation of calculation um, where you see five objects, funny objects being hidden behind the screen, five other objects being added to it, and then when the screen drops, ah, you see five objects, and you should be very surprised uh, by seeing this uh, abnormal event of five plus five equals five. What Colin McCrank had shown was that indeed a few months old, nine months old in this experiment, uh, were capable of noticing the surprising outcome of this arithmetic operation. What we wondered was whether we could use that as a titration of approximate arithmetic uh, in adults. So with Colin McCrank when she was here in Paris a few years ago, we took many hundreds of such movies, we presented them to subjects, and we asked them to rate whether the outcome was a plausible or non-plausible uh, value for what they had seen as the first two stages. And we did that both for addition on the top and for subtraction. And you can see the curve here, for instance, is the curve when the outcome of the addition is eight. And we test eight, but we test also 10 and 12 and 16. And we can see that subjects become less and less pleased with the outcome that they are seeing, tracing these tuning curves. But you can see something funny, which is that the curves are not the same for subtraction and addition. Although the outcome is the same, so it should be 16 in all cases, this, this curve is shifted a little bit to the right, and this one is shifted a little bit to the left. So if we look at this a little bit closer, here are two cases that are very beautiful, where the outcome is 16, it's 24 minus 8, and this one is 8 plus 8. The true outcome is in the middle, but you can see that subjects prefer a slightly larger outcome for 8 plus 8 and a slightly smaller outcome for uh, 24 minus 8. And this is a very systematic finding that addition problems tend to be slightly overestimated and subtraction problems tend to be underestimated very strongly. At this stage, we still don't have a good model for this effect. So it's something that uh, up for grabs for modelers. But we think that it may have to do with this motion effect. So we called it the operational momentum effect, suggesting that it may be analogous to other momentum effects in perception, where you have movement and you are carried away with the movement and you land too far on, uh, in this case, the number line. So in an addition, you're carried away and you land towards two large numbers. And in subtraction, you land towards two small numbers. 
It's just a descriptive term, this operational momentum effect, in want of a better explanation. But it uh, drew us with Andre Knops to do one experiment, which I really like, I still love it, uh, which was to ask whether there is an interaction between the saccadic eye movement circuit and uh, calculation. And so Andre did uh, this fMRI experiment where the same subjects first had a training block with eye movements where uh, essentially we use that to train a computer to decode the direction of eye movements from the pattern of brain activity. So subjects were doing eye movements to the left or to the right, and we trained the decoder to use the pattern of parietal lobe activity. And you can see even with the naked eye that there is, of course, a contralateral organization. It's not huge, but it's present, such that when you make a right saccade, you have more activation on the left side, as I showed you earlier. So a decoder can learn to sort single trials with quite high accuracy, uh, whether they are left or right saccades. But then came the interesting part. We asked the same subjects to do a calculation. It could be analog calculation, like add these two sets of dots and choose which one is the right outcome. Or it could be also symbolic addition, where these would be Arabic numerals, and these would also be Arabic two-digit numbers. And the finding was that the decoder that had been trained to classify saccades would generalize to the decoding of whether it was an addition or a subtraction that the subject was doing. It was not a huge effect, but it was significant, and it was in the right direction. That is to say, when the decoder is, uh, sorts left and right saccades, it sorts an addition like a right saccade, and a subtraction is more neutral, but there is a significant difference. Yeah. So the eye movement areas that care about whether you make saccade to the right or to the left side of space generalize to whether you've been making an addition or a subtraction. It seems that you are recycling these areas for spatial motion when you are doing mental arithmetic. And there is a direction to this effect which is compatible with the snark effect. So again, evidence that there is a tight interaction between the number areas and these LIP-like posterior parietal area that cares about saccadic eye movements and attention. Now there was also the issue of the shape of the snark. Is it really, uh, w w what form takes the interaction between number and space? Is it really linear or is it different? And here, beautiful work from Singler and Opfer um, uh, was uh, striking when they asked children to uh, make a mapping between number and space. They asked children basically, um, where would you place number 20 on this line? Where would you place number 50? Where would you place 57, so on and so forth? And they found this rather remarkable finding, which is that by second grade you are linear, but before, children are not linear. They, they create a mapping, it's not arbitrary, they do place le small numbers left and right numbers to the right, but in between, they have this curvy representation, which is well fit by your logarithm. Of course, they know nothing about logarithms, but they seem to have a compressive representation of numbers, one in which 10 is close to the middle because it's 10 to 1 on the left and 10 to 1 on the right as well, so it's in the middle. Okay. Um, and progressively they learn that the correct metaphor is one of linear space rather than logarithmic space. We uh, were quite excited to extend this data using the Munduruku uh, in collaboration work with Pierre Pika. We uh, have access to these people in the Amazon who are uh, children but also adults with a very simple language for number that essentially stops at five uh, that seems to be only approximate a little bit like adjectives like a dozen or something like that and uh, who can do approximate arithmetic but not exact arithmetic. And we asked them to do this number to space task with all sorts of dots but also tones and spoken Munduruku words, including some syntactic structures that they don't produce but we used, and also spoken Portuguese that some of them know. And our finding was that indeed even adult subjects think of this number to space mapping as a logarithmic mapping when they are not educated, when they don't have a complicated language that allows them to count. So you can see the American participants are completely linear, especially if the line goes from 1 to 10, but the Munduruku participants are curvy. They're also curvy with dots, uh, but um, uh, you can see that from 1 to 100 we can also find that uh, the American subjects have a little bit of a curvature, but they are even curvy also with words, and this is of course totally absent from uh, the data of American subjects. It looks as if uh, there is this notion that numbers form a compressive continuum where similarity is determined by ratio or by logarithmic distance equivalently. 
So uh, we decided with Dror Dotan, who is here in this room, to explore further this effect. And this is new data, which you will see described in a poster today. Um, we use this task that you can see on the screen right now, where we use the iPad to track the finger of the subject as he starts on the bottom. And when he starts moving his finger, a number appears here. Uh, we, and uh, as the number appears, the person has to veer the finger towards the appropriate location on the number line without ever stopping. So the idea is that the finger moves and uh, we can continuously see where it's heading and whether there is or there is not an effect of the number size. And I'm going to close with that by showing you, first of all, this is a fantastic way to collect huge data about the whole sets of trajectory. Every single trial gives you enormous data about the shape of these trajectories and we have to reject just a few which are outliers. You can plot these data as a function of time. So now you have the horizontal position of the finger as a function of time. And you can see how the finger deviates toward the left side or towards the right side. And again, you have enormous information about the branching time where the finger begins to deviate. Uh, this is now the average trajectory, but you can get this information on single trials. And you get information so about the time it takes to reach the final location. But the only thing I'm going to present to you today is that for a given slice of time, we can make a regression and ask, what is influencing the finger position? Is it the size of the whole number? Is it the decades? Is it the units? Is it perhaps the log of the number? If we believe perhaps that in adult educated subjects, these are all educated subjects, maybe there is still a dormant representation of the log of the number. And so these are the results of this regression. As a function of time, you see the building effect of different variables that describe the target number. And you can see, first of all, that units and decades have effects at just about the same time. It's not the case that you start with decades and then you have units. The two-digit number, as we had described 25 years ago, is treated as a whole, or if anything, the units digit are slightly overweighted. Normally, these should converge to exactly one. Transiently, we see a slightly larger effect of the units, as if they were weighted first. But basically, very, very quickly, the subject has a linear understanding of what is the magnitude of the number and how it converts into a spatial location by about 450 milliseconds. But uh, notice also that the logarithm of the number has a transient effect. And it's needed to fit the curve uh, the best. It's a small effect, much smaller than the linear effect. But it implies that in our heads, as we think about these number space mappings, we are transiently activating a logarithmic representation, just like the children, except we know it has to go away. And so it goes away as our finger reaches the end of the line. Um, I want to uh, reach the close of my talk here. I wonder whether this is the end of the hunting and we'll stop hunting the snark. But I want to remind you that at the end of the poem, uh, the hunting for the snark, uh, there's something funny happens. It's a snark was the sound that first came to their ears and seemed almost too good to be true. It's the baker is finding the snark. Then followed a torrent of laughter and cheers. Then the ominous words, it's a boo. In the midst of the word he was trying to say, in the midst of his laughter and glee, he had softly and suddenly vanished away, for the snark was a boojum, you see. It's actually, uh, nobody knows what's a snark or what's a boojum throughout the poem, but uh, Lewis Carroll explains that he had this sentence in his head before he, writes the whole, before he wrote the whole poem. He knew that he had to close with this line, for the snark was a boojum, you see. Uh, which is very poetic, I think. But so uh, the baker disappears. You can vaguely see, this is the original illustration. I think it's hard to see, but you can see the baker is disappearing, uh, fading, because the story is that if you hunt the snark and you're unlucky and you find a boo germ, you're vanishing, you will go away. Okay. So I wonder whether through hunting the snark we might find a boo germ. Um, that's the question for us today. We will hear today a lot of challenges to the snark story that I've told you, which is trying you know, to make a coherent story out of all of this. Um, first, there is this idea that different types of spatial numerical effects may have different origins. So they may not all come from the same level and they are partially dissociable. We know that for a fact now. And in fact, in synesthesia, for instance, Manuela Piazza has shown that these different effects do not always cohere together. We will hear a very interesting story of working memory. It seems that working memory is a key factor for some of these effects and may even change or reverse these effects as a function of which slot in your working memory you are using to store the number or the letter. 
other words. We will even hear that the snark effect may exist in newborn checks from Giorgio Valortigara and from uh, the work of Rugani and collaborators. We have now some rather extraordinary data on animals having a sense of the mapping between number and space, and even the direction of these effects sometimes. We like to think that left and right are arbitrary for small and large numbers, but maybe they are not arbitrary. So all of these, I think, are challenges to the snark effect, um, and uh, I hope we won't find it a boo germ, but I want to close uh, with this other quote from the snark, which is, each thought he was thinking of nothing but snark and the glorious work of the day, and I cannot think of a better introduction to uh, our work today to try to discover what the snark is about. Thank you very much for your attention.